Hey y'all. Um, so today we're gonna kind of talk a little bit more about the 1920s and hopefully, um, you know, you probably have some understanding of the 1920s being like the boom and bust era and a lot of you uh, are reading or, you know, hopefully reading Gatsby at this point. And, um, you know, if you were just to have that book in front of you and someone was like, hey, The Great Gatsby is a history of the 1920s, you would see that literally everyone has wealth or wants wealth. And to be honest, it's not far off, right? Writers don't write in a vacuum. Um, they're, in, they're inspired by the, the life around them. And we're going to take a look at what's kind of inspired that. So uh, this is Wealth in Excess in the 1920s. Dollar bills, y'all. OK, um, click maybe. All right, so a couple things come out during this time. And it really affects how people live their life. Uh, Henry Ford develops, or he doesn't develop the assembly line, but he perfects it almost. Um, he refines it. And what I want us to think about is how this does it, right? It eliminates unnecessary production costs. It keeps everything in line. It keeps everything to a stri strict schedule. Um, and with this, a lot of other industries take this into consideration. And the airline industry booms, and cars boom, and factories boom, and everything is building and everything is cheap. And when things are cheap to build, things are cheap to buy. Yeah, this thing. Um, so think about this question. How will these innovations impact the social life of Americans? What can they do now with cheaper travel? All right, that's one of the things I want you to think about. Jot this question down, think about it. Uh, we're gonna discuss it on Monday, okay? So here are some things that kind of come out of some primary sources, right? The Ford Model T uh, by the Great Pyramids in uh, Egypt. Um, uh, this is uh, Charles Lindbergh uh, flying his spirit of St. Louis uh, across the Atlantic, the first cross-Atlantic flight, right? Very proud moment for everyone. And then uh, an ad for Ford Motor Vehicles, uh, circa 1926, I believe it says in the corner, okay? Um, so all cool things coming out at this time. And notice the advertising. That's what's really going to catch your eye. Now, we have a lot of new things coming out, too, and one of those ideas is consumer control. Workers and consumers have higher wages and more disposable income. They have more money in their pockets. So new technologies, innovations like vacuums and razors and frozen foods and hair dye and appliances and everything is for the consumer now. And there's finally this idea that if someone's not buying it, it's not a good product. So you want to innovate and you want to make sure that you catch the eye. So another question I want you to think about for Monday is, how might these ideas lead to an increase in spending? And ultimately, will everyone be able to participate? Okay. Does everyone have money? Can everyone have money? Think about that. So new innovations that come out. Indoor plumbing for everyone. Now, it's not to say that indoor plumbing wasn't a thing. It's just for everyone now. It's cheaper. Electric irons, washing machines, refrigerators, mouthwash, finally, right? Deodorants, cosmetics, perfumes. Now, what I want you to do is think about putting these innovations into categories, okay? Which one of those things to the left there um, goes with the other things? So how might advertisers market these products to appeal to consumers, right? Think about advertising today. There's a whole bunch of different things. Everything from like Axe saying that if you don't use this product, you're not going to get a girl. Or things like perfume where if you don't use this perfume, uh, the naked guy swimming in the ocean won't come over and his surfboard to you. I don't know. It's all very weird nowadays, but it was even weirder back then. We have things like this, okay? Washing machine. A real servant in the home is a rarity in these days, okay? Uh, can't have slaves anymore, so may as well buy a washing machine. Can we say that today? Probably not, right? And the thing about this, playing off the beauty for your eyes, brilliance, expression, and charm. Use this, use this product by Maybelline, and you will look brilliant. You will look expressive, and you will have charm. Okay? And this is my favorite here. This is this, this one right here exemplifies advertising in the 1920s. Okay? Got nice hair got nice eyes, and you got a great smile, but these charms may be wasted if she uses the wrong deodorant, okay? All of her qualities can be wasted away if she doesn't use the right deodorant. And these are advertisements, man. These are things going out to the public. They're telling people, hey, buy this stuff or people won't like you. Can we do that today? Yes and no. We do it a little bit more subtly, but th these exemplify the things of the 1920s in terms of advertising. Okay, and how do we get advertising to the masses? The radio. Okay, 1920 was the first radio broadcast. Okay, in 1926, NBC, the National Broadcast Corporation, was founded, and in 1927, one year later after NBC, 7,000 radio stations are around the country. Okay, so what I want you to think about is how might the radio impact American citizens in the 20s? And I want you to kind of think about social media today. What's the parallel? Right? What does the radio do for people? What does the radio do for the farmer? What does the radio do for the city dweller? Okay? How do we get these things? 
How do we know about things now? Now, one of the most important things in the 1920s is that everyone coming back from the war wanted to buy things. They wanted to be better than people. So banks started to have this thing where you could buy on credit. And you see these things today, like buy now and pay in an easy installments, right? Um, it's like, Oh, I don't know. Uh, this knife set worth two worth two thousand dollars. Pay in six easy payments of nineteen ninety five. Okay. Um, so the thing about this, and it's big appliances, right? You want the bigger, newer thing. It's not like razors or anything. It's like you want a car, buy it on installments. You want stocks, buy it on installment. You want a radio, refrigerator, washing machine, buy it on installments. Buy it on credit. Seventy five percent of radios and sixty percent of cars are bought on credit. That's huge. That's huge. What if you can't pay that loan back? What if the bank is like, we need that money? And you're like, I don't have it. Okay, what happens? All right? So what I want you to think about for this one is what social impacts does buying on credit have on Americans? Why do it? What are the costs and benefits of it? Do we still do it today? Are there regulations today? Think about those things. So do this experiment. You want a washing machine for $1,000. And you only have $50 to your name. You decide to buy in installments. So the bank says, okay, $42 a month plus 12% interest. How much will you actually pay back? How long will it take? I want you to think about this. Come ready to talk about this on Monday. I'll give you the answer on Monday, okay? So what we want to think about is who's actually wealthy, all right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more on this one day, but look at this, look at the 1920s, okay? Peak of the 1920s, okay? The top 0.1%. Okay, so we have like the 1% and then we have the 0.1%, the wealthiest of the wealthy, okay? They own 25% of the wealth. Same thing in 2013, okay? Um, this one's a little bit more confusing. Just take a look at this. Um, we'll talk about this on Monday again. Be ready to discuss this. What groups are represented in the graph? Okay, what do all the lines represent? And for each group, describe the trend that are showing. What does this mean? Okay, so the top, again, the richest of the rich, the rich, rich of the rich, okay, uh, this is the very, very top, and this is kind of like the, eh, yeah, you're wealthy, but you're not 0.01% wealthy, and look at that skyrocket, that's insane, okay, so like the super rich are getting even richer. Um, all right, so now we have the top 10% of wealthy people, okay. Um, the kind of but still really rich, right? Uh, 1927, okay, only 30%, right? What we want to draw these parallels to is this, okay? Today in the 1920s, who's rich and what are the implications of it, all right? So think about those things. Come ready to discuss these things on Monday um, because, again, I want to sit down and I want to, I want to talk because the 1920s are a very, was a very real thing and the, the day we live in today is drawing some strong parallels to it, all right? And I hope we can discuss it and kind of work some things out as a class on Monday, all right? So you guys have a great weekend. Uh, again, sorry I wasn't here on Friday, and um, we'll continue this talk on Monday, all right? Take it easy.